much. Um, if you'd like to make sure that your microphones are on mute, we do get occasional bits of interference coming in occasionally. Um, please, you know, you know, uh, don't distract people with your, your screens. Um, if you have any questions, please use the chat function. So you can ask those questions in there. What I'll do is I'll corral those questions for later. Um, we'll have four presentations, one after the other. Uh, we'll wait right till we'll rattle through those and then we'll have our questions uh, at the end. So, uh, so today's session, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have four presenters. It's going to be a really incredible seminar. I think this is one of those uh, webinars that tonight you'll be telling your loved ones, hey, did you know, or I was at this webinar today, you'll be telling them something about this webinar later. So uh, and I'd love to hear at some future event uh, what those things were. So uh, our first presenter is Professor Charlie Pedler. He's Professor of Applied Sport and Exercise Science at St Mary's University in Twickenham. Um, He's Associate Professor at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health at UCL. Uh, he's got a wide range of research, uh, athlete health and performance, including cardiovascular performance, which is uh, pertinent to today, iron deficiency, immunity, sleep, altitude, female athlete health and sports injury. I think that is virtually everything. Now, what Charlie's going to talk to us today is about medical encounters at Parkrun. How many acute events actually happen at Parkrun? Given that how many Parkrunners there are and how many Parkruns there have been, there's going to be some things happen. So what's the truth about some of those medical events? Uh, so listen now and Charlie will tell you all. Charlie, please take over. Oh, sorry, just unmuting myself there. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you can hear me okay and see my screen okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a piece of work that we've done fairly recently. Um, I'm based at St Mary's University in Twickenham, just a stone's throw from Bushy Park Run. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to talk about medical encounters um, over the past, or over, over a six year period in, in the UK. So um, just to bring up my slides. So we all uh, love park run or many people do and the, and the benefits of exercise are, are now clearly uh, well-defined, but I'm not gonna talk about that um, because on rare occasions, exercise can also cause medical problems. Um, and in the worst cases, tragically, um, sudden cardiac death. So this is a, you know, a, a very different uh, angle on um, park run. Um, uh, Exercise, you know, carries that that um, that risk, and every year, for example, somebody every few years, somebody dies at the London Marathon, um, and so these events can be uh, very tragic. And it's really important that we understand the um, the uh, and balance the risks of medical problems with the benefits of exercise, and make sure we have appropriate safety mechanisms in place. So. Our aim here was to objectively quantify medical incidents and risk of death at Park Run. And to, to jump straight to my conclusion, and we could kind of stop the presentation there, the risk um, of death at a UK Park Run is extremely low. But of course, there's more to it than that. So um, Park Run does have a very unique database because of its size. It's centralized data, um, means that we can do this kind of study. Um, and uh, in this particular study that, that, that I did, we were able to include 32 million park run participations. Um, and of course, it grows by several hundred thousand every Saturday morning, in fact. So um, alongside that, there's also a single database of all medical incidents that are recorded at park run, which makes this kind of analysis really uniquely possible. Um, we've published this in British Journal of Sports Medicine. I'd be more than happy to share with you the, the, the paper um, if you drop me a, an email afterwards. So um, there's a lot of information on the screen, so just I'm um, going to walk you through it kind of one by one. Um, first of all, um, we limited our analysis to the UK only. Um, Second, we started in 2014, and this is really where the, the database really got going, and it was um, it was uh, became standard protocol for instance to be reported. Um, and then we took a six-year sample um, to get six complete years of data, and that actually coincided with the last full year before 
um, before the pandemic. So it was kind of quite a neat um, uh, six year sample. Um, within that database, you can see it's approximately 50% uh, split males to females. And there is a total of 2 million individuals um, within the, the database. And over time, we accumulated, as I said, around 30 million park runs um, split between the 5K run and the 2K junior event. The two charts at the bottom here show the distribution of running performance. And you can see on that, the chart on the right, which displays the data year by year, there's a very slight shift towards the right in some of these figures. Um, and that indicates a kind of a, a more diverse uh, running uh, population, so um, most likely due to more runners and uh, or slower runners and walkers uh, included in the database. So what we were able to do was um, do a, a, a rigorous audit, a detailed audit of all the incidents in the database. So it was um, uh, over ten thousand incidents, and and within that we identified eighty four. Uh, total life-threatening medical encounters. So really a tiny number compared to the, the number of uh, events uh, that we're talking about, the number of runs that we're talking about. And it actually equates to one per 384,000 um, participations or uh, 0 0.26 per 100,000 participations. Within that, sadly, there's 18 fatalities that occurred. Um, which equates to almost one per 1.8 million participations or 0 0.056 deaths per 100,000. Now it's really hard to understand those kind of figures in your mind. So um, if I put up 10,000 dots on the screen, that might help get some way towards it. But of course we need to do 10 times that for the 100,000 and then multiply that by 17 again to get to, uh, to uh, to the 1.7 million um, runs. So really, you know, you can barely see these dots on your screen. The, uh, the, the incident rate is so low. So how does that, how do the incidents break down? Well, um, predominantly cardiovascular in nature with 48 cardiac arrests um, and uh, 20 individuals with acute coronary syndrome. Um, and then the rest were made up of um, cerebrovascular accidents, including the brain, um, and then um, life-threatening life arrhythmias. Um, the next question is, well, what are the characteristics of these people who suffer? Because obviously the risk is not going to be the same for every runner. So um, again, lots of information on the screen here, but I'll walk you through it. So um, you can see this first one, we have predominantly uh, men. Um, so 16 out of the 18 that died were male, 51 um, out of the 64 that survived amongst all of those incidents were male. Um, you can see there's a spread of ages across here, but bear in mind that we don't have equal numbers of runners across this whole range. So we'll come on to that um, in a little while. Also spread of kind of fitness, if we use personal best runtime as a, as a marker of fitness, and also uh, running experience, if we use the number of runs recorded in the database as, uh, as a marker of experience, we have a good spread there. Um, I'll come back to the other two figures uh, shortly. So I mentioned that the, um, the numbers of individuals are different across each of those uh, groups. So we had to do some really advanced statistical modeling with our friends over at the, uh, at the University of Galway. Um, and what this chart shows um, with these lines is the probability of a serious incident per uh, 100,000 runs and how that changes uh, across the age group. So across these four columns, we've got uh, progressively slower runs. You can see the PB times along the top. Um, and then along the bottom of each of these charts, we've got the, uh, the age range for each of the columns. And then finally here, this is the experience and frequency. So one year of park run uh, with one run per year, all the way through to six years of park run, 30 runs per year. And you can see that the, the most high risk group is this one over in the at the top right, where the male um, rate um, goes up um, most steeply. And we've got a 50 minute park run, one, one year of park run, one run per year. Uh, and then the oldest members of that group are going to have the highest risk. But just to remind you, we're talking about modeling risk in, of extremely rare events. So it's um, so we just got to keep that in mind. Um, 
Finally, here on this chart, I want to note the survival rate. And so we have got an increasing um, number of incidents, potentially because of better reporting um, uh, and, and a better awareness of, of the need to report incidents, maybe because of a shifting demographic as we get more slower runners, um, we might, we're having more incidents. Um, but thankfully, this green line here shows the, the, the rate of death has stayed um, very, very low throughout this period. Um, and actually, we calculate um, a park run survival rate on average of 65%. So if you do suffer with um, a life threatening incident, then um, there's a 65% uh, survival rate and typically what we'd expect and I know other speakers are going to talk about this um, is around 10% uh, survival rate out of hospital so very very good figures and you could argue that um, it's safer to exercise at park run than it is uh, to be in other places um, and probably one of the most important factors here is the availability of uh, defibrillators and uh, we have 100% coverage now of defibrillators um, at park run um, so just to wrap up with some concluding po points, the risk is extremely low at park run. Um, there's a very slightly higher risk in male, slower, older, infrequent park runners. Um, and the survival rate is better than typical out of hospital uh, medical encounters. Um, some limitations really important to be aware of that changing demographic could mean that we have as the as we have more different shapes and sizes of people, uh, in all different um, variety of people attending park run, uh, it could well change that risk. Um, and uh, our analysis was confined to the UK where we have 100% AED coverage, but we don't have 100% everywhere in the world yet. Um, so just some final thoughts on what you could do to maybe help um, uh, keep the, the risk low and, and, and help with this area. One is to make sure we're reporting it all incidents so that we keep a real, uh, uh, accurate track of, of the data um, as park run grows. Um, second is um, making sure uh, or having first aid training and the more people we have at park run the better with CPR or, or AED training um, and know where that AED is located at your event should, a, should an issue arise. And then finally keep um, exercising um, because that's ultimately going to keep you in that bottom left quadrant of that of that chart. So um, that concludes my talk. I shall stop sharing there so that we keep on time and hand back to Steve. Great. Uh, Charlie, thank you very much. Um, so I think that the key, the key message there that, uh, you know, the risk of an incident happening um, is very low, um, but if an incident is going to happen, then it looks like Parkrun is a good place to be. And that leads me on to our second presenter, who is our oh, first doctor of the day. Um, that's, Sorry, that's we could just... it won't upset us because it doesn't bloody work anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Right. Sorry about that. Um, so that leads me on to our second presenter, uh, Dr. Hannah Monday, who's a junior doctor at Swansea. Uh, she graduated in April 2020, uh, went straight into the first wave of the COVID pandemic. So Hannah, thank you very much for all those things I'm sure you've done, uh, which is probably a, a, another presentation altogether. Um, she's also an elite triathlete at the half Ironman distance, and like some, uh, a, lot, a lot of medics, you seem to have a different time zone where you have more than 24 hours in your day, so you're going to hope to compete professionally as, a, uh, as a, an athlete and be a GP at the same time, or, or train to be a GP. I don't know how you're going to do that, but, but I'm really, really impressed. Um, so during Hannah's undergraduate uh, um, time, um, she did a project with Parkrun looking at the prevalence of first aiders um, at Parkruns in, in South Wales. So Hannah, over to you. Thank you so much, Steve. Yeah, thank you for having me. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing um, a project that I did. It was about three years ago now um, when I was a final year medical student. So I am based in uh, Swansea in South Wales and as my final year project I looked at how many first aiders and medical professionals there were at four different park runs uh, in my local area. 
Um, so I collected data at four different hospitals, uh, so Swansea Bay, um, Neath, uh, Porthcawl and Clarely. I asked um, participants in the runs to um, pop their um, barcode tag in one of the six boxes, as you can see there. Um, so whether they were a medical professional, so whether they were a doctor or a nurse, um, whether they were a first aider, so if they'd had a first aid qualification either through their work. Um, I also looked at those who weren't first aiders, whether they'd be interested in the future in taking a course or not, um, but I've not focused on that in this short presentation. Um, and then I excluded under 18s and those that didn't want to be part of the participation data. Um, so back in March 2019, uh, the first run I attended was Porthcall. Um, this is quite close to one of the, the four um, areas that's quite close to a, a large hospital in Bridgend. And so I expected there to be a fairly high number of medical professionals there. Um, I collected data from 292 runners. Um, unfortunately, in a very busy period, about 26 to 30 minutes um, of the park run finish, um, there was a lot of congestion around the finish line and I wasn't able to, uh, they, they halted the study, the race director, because there's too much congestion. So I could only take data from 292 runners um, and of those 7% were medical professionals and 25% were first aiders. So one in four people of that park run um, were, were first aid trained. Um, but yeah, obviously the limitation to, to that study was, was the missing data of about 100 or so people. Um, next, I went to a quite a small park run um, in the Knoll in Neath. Um, this is the only one of the four where um, it's not close to a um, quite a large hospital. So I expected there to be um, a lot fewer medics and, and nurses at this, at this location. Um, only 110 runners and um, less than 2% were medical professionals there, so less than one in 50. Um, a very high number of first aiders at this um, at this event, um, so 42%, so nearly one in two of first aid trained. And um, yeah, I was really interested by this and I was speaking to some of the volunteers and they explained that actually Parkrun and themselves had put on a first aid course the week before my arrival. Um, unfortunately, there'd been a, a local 10K had resulted in a, a, you know, one of those very rare cardiac deaths. And as a result, um, a first aid course had been offered to Parkrun participants. And um, yeah, that would, that would account for the high number of first aiders at, at this event. Next, I went to um, what we'd call the largest uh, park run in the local area, Swansea Bay Park Run. Um, there are 355 runners here and roughly one in 10 of those were medical professionals um, and 20% were first aiders. This park run is pretty much opposite the quite a big hospital in the area. So I expected there to be quite a lot more medical professional and first aiders um, at this course. Um, but I actually chose uh, by complete coincidence, I chose the weekend um, of the Swansea Half Marathon and to take my data. So there were many parkrun tourists and um, lots of people that weren't from the local area that had come to do the, the, the half marathon on the Sunday. And I was collecting data on the Saturday. So um, I'm not sure how reflective this is of um, a typical Swansea Bay park run. Uh, but yeah, one in 10 medical professionals and one in five first aiders. And finally, I headed over to Clonatley, um, again, quite a small park run, but also near a hospital. Um, only 4% were medical professionals um, and one in about one in four were first aiders there. And again, lots of lots of running events in the area. And I'd actually chosen the same day as a 10K event on that day. Again, it was a completely coincidental. Um, so whether this is a typical, um, typical picture for Clonatley, um, yeah, we're not sure about that. Uh, so just to finish with a few graphs, um, so overall 7.4% um, um, of the parkrun field will be medical professionals, so doctors and nurses, 25% uh, first aid trained, so roughly one in four first aid trained, um, and as you can see the spread across the different, um, the different locations as I've already mentioned, so quite a high number of medical professionals at Swansea, but I, again I'd expect this to be higher on a, on a typical Swansea parkrun day, and then a really high proportion of first aiders at the Knoll parkrun where they just held their first aid course. Um, and that's the, the end of my slide, so thank you very much for listening and we look forward to hearing from Forrest for his, his story next. Hannah, thank you, thank you ever so much. Uh, I mean that is really, really intriguing that, you know, uh, one in four uh, park runners are first aid uh, aid trained 
uh, and hopefully we'll have some questions for you later. So uh, we'll move on to, if you could stop sharing your screen, Hannah, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Um, um, stop share. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're going to move on very quickly to uh, Forrest Wheeler. Now, Forrest is uh, an avid park runner and volunteer at Cheltenham. That's where I have met Forrest in the past. Um, he's a chartered financial planner by uh, um, employment. Uh, he's definitely a keen sportsman, running, rock climbing, water sports. Uh, but actually, he's got quite an incredible story to tell you, and, and I don't want to uh, do any spoilers, so I'm just going to let him tell you all about it. Forrest, please go. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, as Steve said, my name is Forrest Wheeler, and I'm the human face of that incredible data that uh, Charlie has just been sharing with us. Um, my story begins on the 22nd of April 2017, when uh, as a fit 59-year-old with no apparent health issues and finding myself at a loose end, I thought I'd have a go at this park run malarkey. Never did it before. It's only 5K. What could possibly go wrong? Um, I registered, as everybody does, found myself for the first time among some 250 plus other park runners milling around in Pitville Park in Cheltenham. A number of us listened to the first timers brief and uh, what immediately struck me was the uh, relaxed, amiable atmosphere at the park run. It was fantastic. Being cheered as a first timer was incredibly uplifting. Um, nonetheless, I was gonna make sure that I did a good time and I was pretty sure I could beat the person next to me. Mm, that was going to come back and haunt me. Um, anyway, so on the stroke of nine, off we set. And this is where my story becomes a, a tale of incredible good fortune, incredible good fortune and quirky coincidences. Soon after the start, um, I suffered a heart attack, followed immediately by a cardiac arrest and fell to the ground dead. Um, effectively, think about about the heart attack as a plumbing issue and the cardiac arrest as an electrical issue, somebody stopped, turned the stopcock and flicked the main switch at, uh, at exactly the same time. So how careless, I hear you say, fancy doing something like that. However, if you are going to do something like this and have one of these events, I really would urge you to actually do it at Park Run. As Hannah explained, there appears to be an abundance of um, NHS professionals and uh, first aiders at any park run meeting. And it was certainly the case on that particular morning. Uh, and in fact, they were queuing up to practice their CPR skills. Um, but all joking aside, uh, good quality CPR uh, extended the period during which a more positive outcome might um, occur. So it was absolutely fantastic that these guys were behind me. I think I've just overtaken them actually. Um, anyway, the second element of um, absolute good fortune and coincidence was that I managed to uh, collapse at the closest point uh, to the exit of the park. And just outside the park, there were a fire crew uh, were idling the time, uh, just waiting to start an exercise. And um, they heard the emergency call and immediately ran to the, um, uh, my, air, uh, my sp spot where I was lying um, with their defibrillator. Uh, fortunately, the fire brigade have a shock first and ask questions later policy. And so they immediately um, applied the defibrillator and shocked me. The defibrillators today, they're absolutely incredible pieces of equipment. And they will walk you through everything that you need to do. Apparently, the defib told them to shock me a further two times before my heart reverted to some sort of semblance of normal pattern. I believe, I don't know, but I believe this was about minute six or seven after my collapse. So again, it's incredible that the time factor played a huge part in this positive outcome as well. At that point, a number of the professionals there um, started the process of stabilizing me. 
including a local GP who had been running with her teenage children. She would normally have been running with her husband uh, on a Saturday, but he'd actually gone into work that particular morning. And um, the relevance of this will become apparent shortly, but it's another of those incredible quirky coincidences. The decision at that point was actually made to call on the skills of the Great Western Air Ambulance um, for both medical intervention and to transfer me to the Bristol Royal Infirmary, uh, which is the Centre of Cardiac Excellence here in the South West. The incredible Air Ambulance team, they um, decided I should be intubated and put into an induced coma. Although at that time, I actually hadn't um, regained consciousness at all. So back to the GP um, and her daughter. The daughter rang her father and explained that the air ambulance was uh, about to bring a runner to the hospital. Her father happened to be Tom Johnson, the consultant cardiologist, who on my arrival undertook uh, the procedure that ultimately put me on the road to recovery. How fantastic, an opportunity to fly in a helicopter. Fabulous. Sadly, in the induced coma, I absolutely knew nothing about this and I could have been in a rickshaw, but here I am arriving at the BRI in Helimed 65. I spent a bit of time in an induced coma, thoroughly enjoying the hospitality um, of the ICU. Um, and then finally, seven days later, almost to the hour, um, walking out of the BRI with nothing more to show for my drama than uh, a massive pile of medication and um, four stents. But as you can see, pretty good mood. Um, in the immediate aftermath of the um, cardiac arrest, I suffered incredible fatigue. Um, I, I can't state that quite enough. It was absolutely bone weary fatigue um, and a deep depression. Um, why had it happened to me? What if it happened again and, and actually there was nobody around to help me? Um, survivor guilt. As Charlie said, very few people actually uh, survive this type of event, although more do at Park Run, which is fabulous. Um, uh, but why me? So in addition, I actually couldn't remember anything of the um, first 72 hours after the collapse, um, which is no bad thing, perhaps, because I don't know if it was one of those um, sort of events that you see on TV where everybody clutches their chests in agony and things like that. I've got no idea whatsoever. I can't profess to seeing my life flash before my eyes. And I certainly can't profess to actually walking towards a bright light either. In simple terms, I was alive, I was dead, and then I was alive. Um, my first memory after collapsing is actually waking up in the hospital and thinking, where the hell am I? And my daughter turning to me and saying, well, Dad, we've actually got something to tell you, because I simply had no idea. However, Three months after the event, and with the consent of the fabulous local park run team, uh, I managed to complete that first park run. Nobody had actually paused my watch when I collapsed the first time. And, and so I hold the rather dubious record for the pit, for longest time to do Pitbull Park Run at three months and 58 minutes. Um, Gradually, uh, with the incredible support of Park Run and all the volunteer team, um, I became fitter. I started to look forward to my weekly fix of both mental and physical well-being, and it really was uh, uh, quite a high at that point. I found the dark thoughts that were plaguing me, overwhelmed me in the early days, began to um, disappear. And I started to give myself challenges that involved trying to walk upstairs without being fatigued. Um, subsequently, I've really been lucky enough to undertake park run in Singapore, Australia. And here I am in New Zealand being soundly beaten by my two-year-old grandson in his favorite running wellies. 
Um, I've managed to run a number of half marathons since that time. And last year, I even staggered around a full marathon. Um, it wasn't a particularly good time. Somebody actually said I should have a go at Milton Keynes because uh, it's flat. I have to tell you, they lied. There is a hill in Milton Keynes and you have to run Epic twice. Um, so finally, here I am, five years down the line, fifth anniversary, and I decided on the fifth anniversary, I should actually complete my 100th park run, um, which just really was quite, a, uh, quite a, an emotional day uh, and time. Last quirky coincidence of the whole thing is that the chap in the dotty hat was actually completing his 250th park run on that day. But he was also the very first person to actually carry out CPR when I collapsed. So I can, hand on heart, excuse the pun, but I can hand on heart, uh, say that park run has actually saved my life. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Forrest. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, if you don't mind stopping sharing the screen while well, I compose myself after that amazing story. So, um, so of course, uh, our next presenter is uh, the aforementioned Dr. Tom Johnson um, that Forrest talked about in his presentation there. So uh, Tom is Associate Professor of Cardiology at the University uh, of Bristol. Um, he specializes in percutaneous uh, coronary intervention. Um, I think that is putting stents in, but you'll put me right if I said that wrong. Um, so, and beyond kind of the acute treatment, um, he, his research area is about recovery and re rehabilitation. So he's the perfect person to tell us all about that. So Tom, over to you, thank you. Thanks, Steve, and, and thanks, Forrest. Uh, Steve and I were very lucky to be with Forrest for his fifth year anniversary and 100th park run, I have to say, it gets no less emotional hearing that story again from you, Forrest. So it is, it's stunning to participate in this event with you. And, and thanks to Steve for putting it together. So I, I just was going to outline basically the realities of our hospital colour caress, which have in part been touched upon both by Forrest and Charlie. To give you maybe a little bit more detail to Forrest's treatment, although the, the idea of describing that as uh, what was it, the um, stop cock and main switch, I think probably makes it far more succinct. And then to think about what happens next after a heart attack or after out of hospital cardiac arrest and what role park run may have to play. Uh, and so we'll touch upon that through the presentation. So Charlie's already alluded to this, you know, unfortunately the survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest is actually pretty poor. Um, and in the UK, in England specifically, it's between eight and 9%. Now there are places in the world that do it better. Uh, so Denmark is probably one of the leading nations and they have a survival that may be closer to 20 or 30%. But the reality is that, you know, um, th this is the most life threatening event that can occur. Um, and so to hear that survival in part at park run is up at 65% highlights, as Hannah's alluded to, you know, the fact that there are people there who have expertise and that there are defibrillator devices available uh, immediately, I think, are the key factors. And this is really becoming a priority for the UK healthcare system. So led by the Resuscitation Council of the UK, there has been a real drive towards considering this chain of survival. And so, you know, the first element of that is early recognition and call for help, which clearly in Forrest's case was done with, with immediacy. The fact that we have early CPR and, and so to, to understand that we have first aiders, you know, on these runs um, across, the, uh, across the UK is obviously hugely gratifying. We've heard about the importance of defibrillation and then beyond that where I got involved is the post resus care. So the idea of delivering uh, the patient to the right place to get the treatment in the, the quickest possible time. Now, the reality is that, you know, outside Parkrun, and this is where that success, that chain of survival has been impacted early in Parkrun, is because actually in the vast majority of, of, of cases, people don't receive resuscitation. And so, you know, there's a lack of education, there's a hesitancy, there, there's an anxiety around actually delivering that care. 
in the community. And that's something that we need to be educating um, at an earlier time, you know, taking this into schools in terms of teaching first aid. So the, the reality is that, you know, of patients that collapse and, and those that medical misadventure that Charlie first outlined in the first presentation, 80%, four out of five, are due to a cardiac cause. And that ECG trace has just shown uh, the, the normal sinus beat um, kind of degenerating into ventricular fibrillation, which is this chaotic electrical rhythm. That's where the main switch, as Forrest described, has been switched off. And there's a need then for us to, to effectively defibrillate, shock the heart back into a normal rhythm. So having access to a defibrillator is key. And we've seen already a question in the chat asking about when it became necessary for Parkrun to have defibrillators. And it looks like 2017 was the point at which defibrillators became a kind of mandated element that took to running these events on a weekly basis. Now, if we turn to Forrest's story, this is actually the ambulance um, chart from Forrest's uh, treatment highlighting the arrest on the park run, the immediate attendance actually of uh, medics, as Hannah's alluded to. So we had anaesthetists actually uh, present and aiding the resuscitation. And then he's transferred to us in Bristol with this electrical trace in the ECG, which suggests that there's a problem, that there's probably a blockage in one of the heart arteries. This is the view from my office window, so I'm fortunate enough to see the helicopter arrive in and know when people are coming. But uh, this is a plumbing issue. So these white um, branches that you can see on the surface of this reconstructed heart by a CT uh, imaging of the heart. What happened in Forrest's case, this is actually Forrest's angiogram, is that we can see that there are areas of narrowing. There's an area of narrowing in the artery on the front wall of the heart. And actually the culprit for all of this um, excitement was this relatively small artery being blocked, which always comes as a bit of a surprise to us when we're doing these procedures that something looking relatively innocent can cause quite, quite so much mayhem. So the reality is that we have this blocked artery that we then go on to reopen. So the first step is to place a wire and then a balloon, and we start to see a return of flow. Now, Forrest, as he described, was an induced coma. So actually, we get very little response from Forrest in terms of understanding whether we're making a difference. In terms of then trying to overcome the problem permanently, we place what's called a stent, which is like a metal scaffold into the artery. And these images on the right are the most incredible images generated from a, a particular model that's been developed in the States, in the University of Minnesota, which I've been very fortunate to, to visit and, and um, experiment on. And this is a stent being inflated into the artery to act as a scaffold to keep the artery open, where, where otherwise it was narrowed and threatening blockage. So, so that's, that's what we're doing by stenting at this branch point. So there's the balloon going up in forest case, and ultimately we get a nice result with the artery that had been blocked now reopened. And Forrest mentioned additional stents. Before he went home, he came back for another procedure once he'd woken from his coma, and we treated this additional narrowing um, on the left anterior descending artery. And then very fortunately, sorry for us, this isn't a picture of your heart, but it's equivalent to your heart, is, is the satisfaction of then seeing that despite all of this, and due to the fact that he only had a six minute downtime before the defibrillation and the resuscitation was effective, we're actually left with a, with a heart pump function that's, that's within normal limits. So very li limited damage has been done. But, and there is a serious but, we focus very much at the present time on these very exciting, quite sexy interventions and are fairly self-congratulatory, I think, about the fact that we've done such a good job. And we package Forest home with a th thumbs up and a smile for actually the wheels only then to fall off once you get home. And I, I think Forrest has beautifully expanded upon those challenges. And, and this is well demonstrated. And, and Forrest's been doing some work with me and uh, colleagues in the UK on a national working group for patients without hospital cardiac arrest to better understand those challenges. And, and you just described what's a bone, bone weary fatigue. And it's very common for people to have cognitive problems. So actually getting back to work and functioning normally becomes quite challenging. Huge and understandable psychological trauma caused by uh, the events. And then also potentially physical problems. You know, fortunately, Forrest uh, came away without any major physical injury, but 
it can be that we can be left with quite significant injury to the heart. And undoubtedly, and one of my greatest worries and concerns, and I think reasons for trying to move forwards on a UK basis, is that we are currently falling short in terms of what we offer patients. Patients with heart attack, patients with atypical cardiac arrest get offered cardiac rehabilitation, but that varies tremendously from place to place across the UK. And that's been acknowledged. I've got a colleague who I trained with actually at St Mary's, who's now um, working in Essex, who's running this Southern Cardiac Arrest UK um, peer group um, organisation, doing fantastic things in terms of peer-to-peer -to -peer to support and trying to engage the, the um, medical community in doing better. And there's, there's another um, website you can also look at, lifeaftercardiacarrest.org, that has some incredibly useful um, material as well. But if we look at cardiac rehabilitation, then the, you know, another problem arises, which is that sadly, at least 40% of people fail to attend this. So it's not attractive. And so although we're, we're offering support, the support isn't being taken. And so you know, we're, we're missing a potential opportunity for enhancing a patient's outcome. And this has been nicely shown, in, I'll just show a couple of data slides, but this is fairly contemporary UK data looking at patients who are, have been referred to cardiac rehabilitation and seeing what impact attending rehab and also undertaking exercise has. So in those, in those patients who did attend rehab, we actually see that over a 12 month period that they start to reach uh, the national average of health related quality of life. This is just a measure of, of how well people are. Um, and we can see that actually over a 12 month period, uh, a survivor of a heart attack is, is brought back up to the national average or above if they're achieving significant activity, 150 minutes of activity <coughs> per week versus less than 150. Now, as I've said, there are quite a few patients who don't attend rehabilitation, but actually if they were to be undertaking physical activity, even in the absence of the support that they get from cardiac rehabilitation, we see that actually they are improving their quality of life quite substantially. And there's been a further fairly large analysis of, of data relating to patients, again, in the setting of, of referral to cardiac rehabilitation, where we see that, that increasing activity or at least maintaining activity from the point of your heart event has very significant benefits. So the further away this diamond is from one to the left side, the greater the benefit. Whereas we see that people who have a decreased activity as a consequence of their event, actually that they see no benefit or there, there is no potential um, of, of benefit over time. And so the conclusion of this really fairly sizable meta-analysis was that we do need to be paying more attention to an individual's physical activity trajectory and that it should be becoming a kind of routine part of clinical practice. We should be you know, promoting exercise uh, in patients, which is something that isn't necessarily well done. Now, having met Steve on Forrest's five-year anniversary of his cardiac arrest, we, we had a chat. I hadn't realised that he was going to interview me while running a 5K park run, but that was another matter. But in doing so, we actually managed to generate, I hope, a very fruitful collaboration for the future. And, and so uh, a wellbeing survey had been undertaken by park run through the COVID period. And from this, we've managed to glean some quite interesting insights through um, park run members who have had cardiovascular disease. And as you'd expect, cardiovascular disease does affect more men than women. So we see that, you know, we, we, we see that this group of park runners are more likely to be male, they're, they're slightly older. That life, start, that life quality of life satisfaction is less than the average. So again, it's less than the national average. And in fact, park runners meet that national average. And I think one of the interesting things that was, was raised within the survey was this question to, to, to park runners about why they would um, seek exercise through park run. And some of those um, responses were in terms of wanting to undertake exercise in a safe environment or because they've been advised by a, by a healthcare professional. And we saw that in, the, in those patients with coronary disease that this was more likely, but actually only 1% of those patients or park runners had actually been referred by a health professional. So there's a huge potential opportunity for us in terms of identifying patients and promoting uh, their attendance. I think the interesting thing was looking at the free text 
that we got from the survey. So I'll just read out a couple of these. Park run gives me an endorphin boost, which phase four cardiac rehab doesn't. Park run can be a wonderful way of giving self-confidence through discussion. And Forrest alluded to some of that in terms of the community. After suffering a mild heart attack, the support from fellow runners was invaluable in my protracted recovery. We also have to just be cautious. So in enjoying running and participating in many challenging activities, I find park run intimidating and become anxious within five minutes. So it's not necessarily for everyone. And just finally, even though I can no longer run due to heart failure, park run still gives me the opportunity to walk with like-minded park runners. And I think it's interesting then to see that this month we, we are celebrating you know, not just park run, but walking or just simply participating in the park run community. And I think that's an important thing for us to recognise in trying to develop programmes where we promote activity and patients. So just to summarise that, then, uh, you know, artifacts, out of hospital cardiac arrest undoubtedly poses a very major risk, although we've heard this lunchtime that park run is probably the safest place to have an out of hospital cardiac arrest. The access to defibrillators and having people with education available to support is absolutely paramount. Uh, and we're evolving the pathways of care for patients, I think, constantly. And, and the shift in emphasis may well be to the point of discharge and beyond, because psychological support and the need to promote physical activity, I think, becomes increasingly important. And undoubtedly, Parkrun offers quite an exciting solution or opportunity, I think, for, for further enhancing the care and the outcome for, for patients um, in the years to come. Thanks for your attention. Wow, Tom, thank you. Uh, a lot of uh, food for thought there. Uh, I'm sorry for those of you if you uh, needed to go uh, at quarter two, we've run over a little bit, but I, I hope you uh, enjoyed it. A lot of most of you stayed, so that's great. Um, there's not many questions. If you've got any questions, please stick them into the chat. Um, th there's one question about um, rehab and one question for you, Forrest. Uh, did you have any interaction with cardiac rehab staff? Uh, were you offered a, a rehab program? So, so here you go. Were you one of the 40% that actually went? Uh, yes, I, <laughs> I was one of the 40%. Uh, I religiously went every week for six weeks in a row. And um, I have to say, that uh, uh, it, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I felt it really did me a world of good to actually go along to that. Um, there was a, a lot of, uh, I mean, it's a, a mixed bunch and there were people there that were obviously very, very ill. Um, but but the, the, the program itself really was tailored to each individual. So it was very good, I enjoyed it. Um, so someone's just asked the question. I don't quite know who to give this to. Maybe, maybe to Charlie. Um, should our first time as briefing caution older males against being too competitive? <laughs> I think that's a really uh, good question. Um, I think the um, I think Parkrun's stance has tried to kind of minimize interventions as much as possible and if you're looking purely at the data here you would say that the risk is so low that you know that's you know potentially unnecessary to do that um but yeah i mean that that may well be a factor we don't specifically know if that competitive nature is contributing to the incident rate um but i think um yeah there's you know I think there's potential for us to kind of look at the, the higher risk group and just, you know, at some point raise that they are at a very slightly higher risk. Um, but as I say, um, it's not necessary given the, 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 the stats are so, you know, so low for this kind of thing. I think the important thing is everybody runs, you know, certainly when they start running, they run how they feel and they enjoy themselves. Yeah. Um, Hannah, I just want to come to you. Um, there was a question earlier on where someone asked how, representative do you think your stats might be for the rest of the country have you, have you got any feel what what you know if, if i had to you know pin a number on you and say what proportion do you think the uk has in terms of first aiders at, at park from what what would your answer be yeah i think it's it's really interesting isn't it and even within such a local area um so from the furthest point was about 20 miles between the two the, the, you know, the furthest two points that I chose, there was from one was 2% and the other one was, you know, much, much higher. 
Um, so I think there's a lot of variables in play and I think park runs that are closest to hospitals will definitely have a higher percentage of, um, you know, medical professionals and first aiders. So I think there is such a spread. I'd, I'd imagine England has similar um, kind of spread as, as Wales. I wouldn't imagine there's too much difference there. But I think, yeah, from isolated park run to park run, it, it is quite different. Yes, right. Thank you. Well, I've just kind of did some back of the envelope calculations and the, you know, the average park run is 200 or so uh, people. Um, so according to your numbers, I reckon there's probably between 10 and 20 medical professionals and, uh, you know, a quarter, about 50 first aiders in there. So um, I, 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 someone said earlier on, I think it was Charlie and Forrest have said this in the past, if you're going to have a heart attack, have it at park run. Um, but please just don't in the first place, I think is also what to say. Um, and I think we're probably going to have to finish there because uh, most people will, will be wanting to go for their lunch. Um, I just want to uh, share this last screen. Um, let me go to this one here. Um, if I can just share this last uh, screen here. Um, so I, I'll just make it a little bit bigger. So that was our initial slide. So here on the left is Charlie's paper. It's um, open access. So underneath here, you, if you go to this website here, um, if you want to quickly write that down, bjsm.bjm.com, um, you go there, look up Charlie uh, Peddler and you'll find his paper. Um, equally on the right hand side, there's a paper here uh, that uh, we've written here from um, uh, Sheffield Ham University, which Tom alluded to, uh, Parker and the Promotion of Physical Activity, Insights for Primary Care Clinicians from an Online Survey. It gives you a bit of a feel for what parkruns are um, uh, and, and the kind of health conditions that parkrunners actually, actually have. And again, there's a, 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 a link below there. There's a lot of other, you can look up the parkrun research websites. We have got many, many papers about uh, parkrun uh, research. So um, we will have another webinar um, just after Christmas uh, to coincide with the new year and the little spike that we see of parkrun registrations and participation. Uh, I'd like to thank our presenters uh, for presenting today and answering those questions. Absolutely brilliant. I hope you really enjoyed it. Uh, have a lovely day. Thank you. Goodbye.